Hi class and welcome to the first screencast for the unit on the chemistry of life. So to start this unit we're going to focus on Big Idea 2. So remembering that Big Idea 2, Big Idea 2 is discussing how life has to use energy and molecular building blocks to grow, to reproduce, and to maintain that dynamic homeostasis. So to begin this video we are going to look at um, those building blocks. What are those building blocks? So looking at matter, looking at water, looking at carbon. So <clears throat> here's the overview of this entire unit. We're going to look at uh, how living systems take in that matter from the environment to, and how they use it to grow and to reproduce. So we're going to start by looking at matter and carbon. And this video will also look at carbon and why carbon is so amazing. Next video, we'll look at macromolecules. And this is going to be a tough video. This is going to require some self-study on your part. And then lastly, to finish up, we'll take a look at enzymes. So enduring understanding, remember these um, enduring understandings carry through for the entire year. So growth, reproduction, maintenance of homeostasis, all of these things in life require energy and matter. And so one of the things I want you to think about is what is energy? What is matter? As we go through, especially this video, keep those two questions in mind. And the next question you should be thinking of, well, where do we get all this matter from? Where do living systems get matter from that they need to live and grow and reproduce? Well, the answer is elements. Matter is made of elements. Elements are made of matter. Life requires 25 essential elements. And of those 25, there are six that are really, really important. And I, I call them chinops. And so this is carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, the six most abundant in living systems. And so we find these in proteins, in carbohydrates, in fats, in lipids, and especially in our DNA. So we're going to take a look at matter and elements, and especially to begin, we're going to take a look at water. So hydrogen and oxygen makes up water, which is also matter. And so water has some pretty unique properties we're going to investigate. And all of the, its unique properties are due to two things, its polarity and its hydrogen bonding. So let's take a look first at its polarity. Uh, first of all, polarity simply means that it its opposite ends have opposite charges. That's what polarity means. So when we look at a molecule of water, we have uh, one oxygen and two hydrogens. And so the hydrogen ends actually have a positive charge, and the oxygen end has a negative charge. So that's what it means to be polar. And the reason why it's like this is because oxygen really likes electrons. It's electronegative. So it pulls electrons towards itself, and as it does that, it gets that negative charge from the electron. So it therefore has this negative partial charge, which is then leaving the hydrogens with, with more of a positive charge. So it's all due to oxygen's high electronegativity, which makes one water molecule a very polar molecule. Uh, another way to look at it is in this diagram here. So here's all the electrons. Oxygen is pulling those electrons towards itself. And so the hydrogens are left with a positive charge and the oxygen with a negative. Now this bond here, I need you to know, this bond is a polar covalent bond. And remember from chemistry, covalent bonds are very, very strong bonds due to the sharing of electrons. So this bond here within one water molecule is a polar covalent bond. The other really unique property of water is hydrogen bonding. Because of its polarity, when we get more than one water molecule together, we have the negative oxygen from one water molecule attracted to the opposite charge of a hydrogen in the other water molecule. So a negative is attracted to a positive. And so the bond that forms then is called a hydrogen bond. So a hydrogen bond is simply a bond between hydrogen and another more electronegative atom, like oxygen or like a nitrogen or a sulfur. So these are all hydrogen bonds. But remember, this bond here is a polar covalent bond. So polarity and hydrogen bonds are going to play a huge role in all of the things that water does for life. And so when we think about water and all the amazing things that water does for life, the idea of it and emergent properties comes into play. Maybe you've never heard of emergent properties, so I'm going to introduce it to you. These are novel properties or new um, original properties that arise due to arrangements and interactions of lower levels, but that aren't necessarily there at those lower levels. 
And the best way to explain it is through an example. So our brain, right, our bodies have thoughts and memories and feelings and emotions. So these are considered emergent properties of the complex network interaction of our nerve cells. But our individual nerve cells certainly do, don't have thoughts or memories, do they? So these arise as a consequence of that interaction. So that those are called emergent properties. And so one water molecule does not have all of the properties of water molecules combined together. So these are, would be considered emergent properties of water. And I want you to think about and write down in your notes, can you come up with one other emergent property that you can think of in life, maybe from your summer assignment on the evolution unit, something that is coming about at higher levels but is not necessarily there at the lower levels, like the interactions of water molecules. So some of water's emergent properties, the first one is cohesion, water molecules binding to other water molecules. Co means like or together, so water with water. Adhesion is the opposite, the clinging of water molecules to different substances that aren't water, like water clinging to the sides of a glass or a graduated cylinder. Insulation, insulation of large bodies of water. You notice in the wintertime, a large body of water has a layer of ice on top of it. It's, it serves as insulation, doesn't it, for the seawater and the sea life below. And this is because ice floats. And so we're gonna take a look in class as to why ice floats and look at the molecular structure of ice. And the last emergent property of water is that it is a universal solvent. It is the best solvent. It can dissolve so many different types of solutes, and it dissolves polar compounds the most easily because it itself is polar, and like dissolves like. I'm sure you've heard that saying before. So all of these emergent properties are due to polarity and hydrogen bonding. And so in class, we're going to take a look at these properties in, in depth more and think about what do all of these have to do with the maintenance of life? So we're going to apply these to plants, to animals, to bacteria, to any other form of life you can think of, and we're going to apply these concepts to them. So now let's move on to another uh, type of matter besides hydrogen and oxygen and water, and we're going to look at carbon. And carbon is really, really cool, and I'm going to tell you why. Um, Carbon, more so probably than any other atom, has to move from the environment to organisms where the organism then uses that carbon to build carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, nucleic acids. Um, the organisms use it for storage. They use it for cell membranes, lots of things. In fact, carbon is the backbone of all biological molecules. We, our life on Earth is a carbon-based life form. So carbon is really, really cool, and it comes in many different forms. And we um, are sort of studying organic chemistry. Organic chemistry simply means the study of carbon compounds. So if you see, if you um, consider something organic, that simply means that it's carbon-based. So why? Why is carbon so cool? Well, the real reason is because of its electron configuration. It has four valence electrons, which remember from chemistry means those outer shell electrons. So there are those four electrons. Because of that, it can bond with up to four other atoms here and here and here and here. And so this can lead to a huge diversity of shapes and sizes and configurations. We can have lots of branching, so this is an example of a carbohydrate. We can have rings formed, so this is an example of a nitrogenous base of a nucleic acid. Uh, they are available in proteins. We've got double bonds forming. We can have hydrocarbons and lipids, so long chains of carbon-hydrogen bonds or carbon-carbon bonds. So very, very interesting um, shapes and sizes for carbon-based molecules. Now, another really important thing about carbon-based molecules is that we can look off of here. Coming off of all of these carbon bonds, we've got different sort of side chains, don't we? Well, these are called functional groups. And so the next couple slides, I apologize, they're going to be kind of boring, but we need to learn the different function functional groups of organic molecules. And so it really is the functional groups that are actually involved in the chemical reactions that we see in everyday life. So it's important to know the structure of the functional groups um, and the function and the properties as we move through chapters four and five and really throughout the rest of the year, we're going to come back to these functional groups. So the first one is a hydroxyl group. This is simply OH. This is a polar functional group. It attracts water molecules because it's polar. And the common name of this OH is simply an alcohol. And so a lot of the um, molecules that have a hydroxyl or OH in them end in OL for alcohol. 
so that's OH. Carbonyl is our next one. We've got two types of carbonyls. Um, really what it is is a carbon here, and it's double bonded to an oxygen. So O double bonded to a carbon. That's a carbonyl. Um, and it can happen inside of a chain. So all of these guys here are C's. Or it could happen at the end of a chain. Okay, so when it's in the middle, it's called a ketone. When it's on the end, it's called an aldehyde. Um, but either way, it's a carbon double bonded to an oxygen. Next kind of similar is a carboxyl. Um, so this is a carbon double bonded to an oxygen and at the same time to a hydroxyl. So this whole thing is a carboxyl functional group. It's acidic because what can happen is, is it can donate this hydrogen. Remember from chemistry, an acid is something that donates a hydrogen. So when it donates a hydrogen, it then gets a negative charge and the hydrogen is out here on its own. So carboxyls are always acidic. Um, it's also called carboxylic acid. So this is an example here, um, acetic acid. Next functional, oh, also, these are always found in amino acids. There are two functional groups that are always found in amino acids. Carboxyl is one of them. And the other one is the amino group, the amino group. And so the amino group is simply a nitrogen. Um, with two hydrogens coming off of it, or sometimes we see it like this with three hydrogens and a positive. These are always bases. These are always bases because they can accept this extra hydrogen, and we call these the amines. Next, sulfhydryl, we call these the thiols, and these, um, this is a very easy one. This is just simply a carbon bonded to an SH. So an SH is the sulfhydryl group, and this stabilizes many different protein structures. And so we're going to see these sulfhydryls and disulfide bridges when we look at proteins in the next video. All right, phosphate. This is one of the most important ones. Uh, P, double bonded to an O, another O, and another O. Okay, so here is our phosphate group. Um, very important to know that this is a, a, the, the very important part of ATP, which is the energy molecule of life. So this phosphate group is what gets transferred when we transfer energy between molecules. So energy and negative charge. Those are two things you really need to understand about that phosphate group. Okay, and the last one is the methyl group. The methyl group is simply a C bonded to a CH3. This is really important in gene regulation and gene expression and protein regulation and expression. And so we're going to look at how the methyl group does that later on in the year. So to summarize this video, we learned that carbon is the backbone of life. We learned about the, all the sort of functional groups that are involved in chemical reactions, and that's just going to require making some flashcards and, under, and memorizing and understanding those functional groups. So we really hit home that matter needs to be taken in from the environment, and that comes in the form of carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, and they're used for a variety of molecules in life proteins, nucleic acids, fats, carbohydrates, and we're going to take a look at all of these things in more detail in the next video when we look at macromolecules. So I have three questions for you to answer in your video notes. What would be the effect on the properties of the water molecule if oxygen and hydrogen had equal electronegativity? So asking you to sort of think about that. Another important functional group is methyl, which was one of the last ones we looked at. How does this group differ from all the other groups? And lastly, some scientists believe that life elsewhere in the universe is silicon-based. Given what you know about carbon and silicon, explain why silicon is more probable than, say, aluminum-based or neon-based life. 